So the, the, it's presented by three people. The, the first speaker, which I, I will introduce, is uh, Clemens Portel, uh, and he's a, a key contributor to, to the new bread of OGC standards, not only uh, OGC APIs, but also um, other standards like uh, features and, and geometry JSON. Uh, I think he's sharing uh, five uh, standard uh, working groups, and, and he also contributes to, to free and open source projects like uh, LD Proxy. Uh, along with uh, with uh, Clemens, hopefully, <laughs> we will have Tom Credilis and Peter Vretanos. But uh, let's start with uh, with Clemens. So I, I'll give you the, the floor. Okay, thank you. Um, can you see my screen, the presentation? Yeah. Yes, we can. Good. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> perfect. So I'll start. Uh, <clears throat> so as uh, Joanna has uh, explained, I will. Uh, start a little bit of a deeper dive. It's not that much time, so the dive won't be that deep, uh, but we'll have a closer look at into three of the OTC API standards uh, that Gobi has just introduced. Um, and <clears throat> I will give an introduction to OTC API features. And after that, my colleagues, um, Tom Kralidis and Panayotis Retanos uh, will uh, provide an introduction to uh, environmental um, oops, why don't the slides progress? Let me see. Uh, EDR, environmental data retrieval and records. So I do have some problems with the slides. Let me try again. No, okay, so let's do it differently. Let's try this one. <clears throat> We, we can see your, your slides fine. Okay, um, yeah, but they didn't advance for me, so. <clears throat> All right, so they, these are the three uh, APIs and we'll hear more about those as we go through. So let me start with um, OGC API features. <clears throat> uh, Gobi has already mentioned that there are two parts that are published. Uh, one is core, um, which is the basic capabilities that everyone needs that wants to share their feature data on a fine-grained level. Uh, that is uh, published since two years now. Uh, <clears throat> part two was added uh, one year ago, which adds support for kind of reference systems beyond WGS84. Uh, part three, where we are close to uh, reaching the final release candidate and start into the approval process, will add support for filter expressions uh, for more complex queries, richer queries, similar to what was possible with WFS. And part four will add uh, simple transactional capabilities um, to uh, mutate features. Uh, and uh, I'll give a brief overview of those um, <clears throat> four parts, uh, mainly focusing on, on part one. So since these are HTTP web APIs uh, or RESTful APIs, uh, however you want, we're basically publishing resources and I will give a brief overview of the resources that uh, an OGC API uh, supports. So the, <clears throat> the basic, the first three resources are actually not feature specific, but they're kind of uh, repeated uh, in the other OGC API standards. So they're kind of the, the common glue to tie them together so that we can publish in one API uh, <clears throat> features and tiles and coverages at the same time, for example. So the, the starting point is a landing page resource, which mainly has just links to the sub resources and other potentially also external resources. Um, then we have a conformance declaration, which is just a list of uh, conformance classes identified by URIs. Um, that the API says it conforms to. This is to help clients that are familiar with the OGC API standards um, to actually understand the capabilities so they can formulate requests that the API can support. Then there is also the API definition, which is uh, currently, it's an open API 3.0 document, um, kind of the successor, uh, the non-geo-specific successor for the capabilities that describes the APIs. Um, and using open API also helps that uh, uh, people who are not familiar with the OGC API standards can still understand um, 
the the APIs um, without necessarily reading the standards themselves. Um, the APIs don't have to be part, can also be an external resource, the API description or definition, but most implementations include them also as part of the API. And now we're getting more into data resources. And what we, what we do is basically we organize, we group the features into collections. Um, in, this can be feature types, like it's done in, in uh, WFS uh, with feature services, but you can also use other organizations to group your data. This can also by, be by region, for example, or by any other uh, characteristics. So it's, uh, it's completely up to you how you actually uh, organize your data. And the resources, the collection resource provides then uh, important information so the client can actually send meaningful queries. So for example, it lists the spatial and temporal extent or the CRSs so that the client knows I can request data in this area or in that time span uh, or in, in that CRS. And finally, the key resources are the features. Um, and so every feature, uh, every single feature has its own URI so you can link to it. But there is also a feature collection resource uh, for or the, the features resource, which is, for example, then a GeoJSON feature collection that is returned. Um, and uh, that resource, you can apply simple filtering capabilities. So for example, uh, a bounding box query, uh, a daytime query for a temporal uh, filtering, uh, some uh, collection specific attributes that you can query. That's uh, There's nothing standardized, but you can do that in the API. And finally, also a, a page limit parameter. Every API supports paging. So if you have millions of features, you don't overload um, uh, the, 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 the client, um, and, uh, but you can page through the data if you request 10,000 features at a time and clients do that like uh, uh, QGIS or ArcGIS and others. Um, <clears throat> that was part one, that's the core, that's the basic capabilities everyone needs. And in part two, we add support for coordinate reference systems that are identified by, by URI. So it's basically the EPSG CRSs um, and, and also the uh, ones that are standardized by, by OGC. Um, <clears throat> and that has two parts um, in the collection uh, resources, we add information about the available CRSs that are supported and also the, the storage CRS. So, because if you request the data in that CRS, then there is no uh, coordinate transformation that is, uh, uh, that is necessary. And um, then for the feature resources, we add um, query parameters so you can decide or select the CRS that you get back in the response or if you send a, a bounding box parameter, you can also use local CRSs in, in that parameter as well. The response will always have a, a HTTP header content CRS, which identifies the CRSs that is used in the data, independent of whether the, the actual format supports that information. Um, <clears throat> filtering is part three, um, which basically is very simple in what it adds. Uh, it just adds the capability using uh, um, filter parameters, query parameters to add uh, more complex filter expressions. Uh, this could be, uh, if you want to use XML, you can use uh, the, the uh, um, filter encoding from WFS. But in parallel, we are actually standardizing uh, the common query language, which was originally designed in the catalog service for the web standards. And we are making that uh, uh, full standards, um, uh, uh, extending that and supporting two different encoding. One is a text encoding. You see a simple example on the left, lower left-hand side and also a JSON example, which will later on be used uh, if you submit queries uh, in, in payload with post requests. Then the fourth part, uh, transactions, create, replace, update, delete features. Um, we're just leveraging the HTTP methods to actually uh, create new features, replace an existing feature, uh, update one with a, with a patch operation or delete to delete a feature. So that's relatively straightforward uh, uh, by just leveraging the HTTP semantics. 
Um, once we, we are through with those, we already have a list of um, five more parts that uh, we, we plan to work on. Um, I don't want to go into details for, for time reasons, but you, can, you will get the slides. Um, and, uh, and there's also a link to the charter. They are described in the charter. And that's what we will focus on then over the next year. Um, and finally, to conclude, um, oops, some, some links to additional resources on the OGC website, the, our GitHubs, uh, lists for where you can find implementations, uh, certified products, and other also all the client implementations. And also some, if you want to play with it, uh, some APIs that are in production uh, from, from Canada and from, from, from Germany. Uh, and I think with that... Cle Clemens, would it be possible to uh, paste the link of the slides if you have them online somewhere? Because they, um, they look a bit strange. Well, when, when you can. When you okay, can. Uh, they look strange. So, um, yeah, I, can, I don't know if it's the presentation is shareable. Probably Gobi will know that because you opened that. Um, okay. Well, so, we can go to that later, yeah. No, don't yeah. worry about that now. Okay, they look fine on my side. So, um, Tom, do you want to share them, I guess, yourself uh, for EDR, probably? That's better then. Okay. Uh, Tom, I think you, you are muted. Sure, I'm happy to share them. Uh, just let me get my screen set up here. Uh, that's not it. Okay, I think uh, you're sharing your... Uh, yeah. My desktop. Yeah. Okay. Are, are, we can, can see folks see slides. that? Yeah, we can okay. see uh, ADR. Excellent. Okay, so let me just put it in presentation mode. Okay, excellent. Um, th thank you, Clemens. So fo following on, you can, you, can, you can see the value of the OGC APIs with the, with the building blocks that, uh, that, that Clemens demonstrated and Peter will demonstrate them as well afterwards. Here we're going to talk about uh, um, the EDR way of uh, of leveraging those building blocks for uh, for environmental data retrieval use cases. So um, here we see our building block slide. So you, you see the familiar landing page, the uh, listing of collections, the API uh, uh, definition, as well as being able to list the collections and uh, and their items. But here. Uh, things that are specific to environmental data retrieval are the are query patterns so uh, environmental the edr specification is a convenience api which is modeled which is designed around asking very easy questions from uh from a potentially large persistent uh, data stores data source with, without having to necessarily know um, whether it's a coverage underneath or it's a feature uh, uh or or a feature type or, or what it is so we define these, uh, uh, the, the bread and butter of the spec is the query types. So imagine um, doing a trajectory or a corridor or slicing or trimming, um, which is really the, the, the meat and potatoes of the, uh, the specification. So implementing an, an EDR server implements all the, the, the baseline things that we've seen previously and also adds a few more endpoints to satisfy um, Different uh, different types of metadata as well as uh, as as well as as well as query patterns. So discovery and access is a core proponent of the specification. Here is a sort of uh, thirty thousand foot view at some of the core um, endpoints that are supported. So we have the landing page. We also have the conformance declaration, and then you can you can inspect that and see which conformance classes the the API or the implementation uh, supports. You get a listing of collections uh, and a collection ID for a single collection description, obviously. And again, these query types. So very, very simple. And the query types can be anything from position queries or, or, uh, or, or cube queries, trajectories, corridors, uh, a number of different queries around multi, you know, single or multi-dimensional uh, data. Some example use cases. So we like to think of EDR as a sampling API, and here are some examples of what we uh, of, of what we have envisioned. So imagine uh, doing data extraction from uh, from numerical weather prediction, where I want to provide a point, as well as uh, you know maybe uh, you know maybe some temporal information. Um, so I can do a position query against a uh, against a given against a given date time, 
or I want to do a trajectory query or a corridor query. That's uh, that's one use case there. So very good for uh, uh, for flight planning or doing sort of weather. Uh, you know, what's the weather going to be on my driving route? Kind of uh, kind of analysis. Um, another another example of, of the safe sampling API concept is, for example, if you have monitoring stations or if we have you know upper air observations, so METARs, for example, um, we can use the the, the, the METAR uh, stations, if you will, as uh, instances in the actual data just ends up uh, being shown as actual items. So it looks very close to an OGC API feature server um, because we're reusing those parts from that, uh, from that specification. So uh, the value add of EDR is basically um, providing the ability to do the, uh, the instances as well as the query types. In terms of conformance, it's relatively simple to set up your own EDR. Um, you need to support the the core conformance classes, and at the at the end of it, of all the query patterns that are supported, you only need to support one of them. The most common one is the position query or the point query. So you basically would pass a point into uh, into a given collection, and you would say, "Well, tell me what's exactly what's at this point." And the uh, the the server has no sort of requirements for uh, no mandatory specific encodings. So it's implementation specific on what your response format uh, sh could be or should be. We highly recommend uh, coverage JSON, but other other formats, you can provide them just the same. And I know in our implementation, we have NetCDF, um, we have GRIP2 and, uh, and, and other formats as well. So it's really up to you. Um, there's nothing specific with regards to output encodings. Some of the query patterns and some a little bit more on some of the parameters. So shared parameters across all the queries, the query patterns include uh, coordinates. So we use well-known text to be able to, for the client to articulate the, co the, uh, the coordinates, date time, which would be an RFC 3339, the coordinate reference system, as well as formats. And a lot of the query patterns also uh, exist, uh, support a Z parameter for you know, the vertical level or the pressure level. We also support a parameter name for given you know, weather variables or, or elements, let's say. In another, uh, in a, in a monitoring perspective, some examples. So, in in the PyGeo API, which is an open source project, which which we discussed this week, we implemented OGC API uh, uh, EDR at an earlier OGC API OGC API sprint, and that's supported in the uh, software already. There are a number of other uh, implementations. Here's an example of some coverage JSON output as a result of uh, of an area query. And here's some other implementations. So uh, clients, so a lot of work uh, came out of the UK in terms of doing uh, uh, leaflet plugins and then coverage JSON readers in JavaScript. There's a link there on all the implementations um, that you can uh, look, look for more information on servers, clients, as well as actual uh, deployments. And there's even some code pen examples to, uh, to, to help along with some web development. And with that, I will turn it over to Peter. Thanks, Tom. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Excellent. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, share screen. Peter, we, we are slightly over time. So I yeah, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll, I will <laughs> really sort of try to do it in five minutes, what I okay. would do in 10 minutes. But anyway, Perfect. okay, let me get the slideshow going here. Slideshow from the beginning. Okay. You can see the slide, right? Can you see the slide? I hope you can see the slide. No. No. How about now? No. 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 Okay. Let me try something else. Hold on. We will doesn't like sharing my entire screen, so I will try sharing an application. Uh, share screen, share window, share this window, share that. How about now? Can you see my slides? Uh, I'll wait. I think I need to add you to the stream. Yeah, I think I think now we can. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. How about now? As it's coming. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. We, great. We Excellent. Woo. All right. We'll skip that. Uh, we'll skip this because you'll know the agenda as I go through it. We'll skip the use cases. They're there for people who uh, are interested when they download the slides. Okay. 
the OGC API record specification at its core defines a bunch of building blocks. The, you can take these building blocks and assemble them to deploy certain catalog patterns or various catalog patterns, three of which are actually part of the specification, but others are probably possible. These are Lego blocks and you can assemble them any way you like, I suppose. Um, so the, the first building block is, is the record and that's the atomic unit of information of a catalog. It's basically a list of properties and you use that list of properties to describe a resource that you want to make discoverable through the catalog. We have a JSON encoding brick uh, that it, you know, tells you how to encode that record in JSON. Another one that has requirements for encoding that record in HTML. Then we have a collection brick, which lets you assemble a set of these records into a collection or a catalog. <clears throat> We have an API for records, which is basically what Clemens described at the top of this presentation, which is the OGC API features specification is the API for records. We add a few query parameters to that. So we have this query parameter brick, things like Q for doing text searches and type for searching for resources of a specific type and a few other parameters. Uh, we have a sorting brick so you can ask the catalog, give me some records and sort them in a particular order. We also have the CQL that Clemens talked about in his presentation is also applicable to records. And you can use that brick to add advanced filtering capability to your catalog. And then if if you're so inclined, there are certain use cases that still use open search, especially in the Earth observation community. And we have uh, we have bricks for those, the open search API and the Atom uh, encoding for the record. OK. So now we have all these bricks, this bag of Legos, and we can assemble them into different kinds of catalog deployment patterns. We envision three of them that are in the catalog and the OGC API record specification, but as I said, others are probably um, possible. So the first deployment pattern is what we call a crawlable catalog. So you have a bunch of resources sitting out on the web, maybe in a web directory or in S3 buckets, and you wanna make them discoverable. So what you do is you grab a record brick and a, you know, a JSON brick and an HTML brick, meaning that you create records in JSON or HTML or both to describe each of the resources that you wanna make discoverable. From that record, you include a link to the resource so that if you find the record, you can navigate to the resource. And then you can aggregate a set of these records into a catalog by using a collection uh, brick or a collection uh, object. Uh, again, encodable as JSON or HTML. And that collection object will have explicit links to every record that is part of that catalog. We call this crawlable because if you find the collection or the record, someone sends you an email or whatever, you can crawl to the resource but it's not searchable. In other words, I can't say in this catalog deployment, uh, you know, here's a B box, show me all the records in the B box. So this is what we call a crawlable catalog. And you may recognize this as one of the deployment patterns that's used in Stack. Stack does this. Uh, you know, they create Stack items that describe Sentinel uh, products, and then they have uh, catalogs that, you know, aggregate the records. So that's the crawlable catalog using the building blocks that we had. Uh, forget that. The next one is the searchable catalog. So again, we have a bunch of resources that we're trying to make discoverable. So usually if you have a searchable catalog, it's back-ended by a database. And then you implement the OGC API features um, API that Clemens described up on top. So you get the features API, you get the collection object, you get JSON and HTML encoding of the responses. <clears throat> to that, you add the query parameters that are defined in OGC API records. That gives you catalog specific query capabilities, things like text search, searching by resource type, etc. You can also optionally add the CQL to get advanced filtering, the sorting if you want to sort the responses, and even open search if you want to apply, uh, you know, uh, offer an alternate API for open search clients. Again, something that's common in the Earth observation domain. Then once you have this service built, 
with these building blocks, you start harvesting the metadata that's describing each of your uh, resources, and that creates a record in the catalog. Those records get stored in a database, and at this point, you have a searchable catalog, which means I can say something like this, give me all of the records in a particular uh, bounding box during a particular time period. The service will execute that query, identify the records, and once you've found the records, they will have links to the resources, and you can navigate to the resources. Okay. And now we are going to talk about local resources catalog. So there's this thing called the OGC API resource tree. We have lots of resources. That's an active link. If you follow it, when you get the slides, it'll take you to a, a page that I maintain of that. And some examples of the resources in this tree are the slash collections resource, are the slash processes, uh, scenes. These are all lists of other resources. And sometimes if you deploy a, a, a OGC API, you could have tens of thousands of collections and hundreds of processes. So using the OGC API records building block, you can enable catalog-like queries at these endpoints. So what do we what does that mean? Well, I mean, usually if you've deployed an OGC API, you'll have a collections object, and that collections object can be represented as JSON or HTML. So to enable catalog-like queries on it, you add the query parameters from OGC API records. You can optionally add CQL to that endpoint and sorting. And now you have the ability to do something like this to say, give me all of the give me the collections or list the collections that are in this bounding box and during this time period. Uh, okay, forget that. So now I'll just get into some very quick uh, details about the specification. These are all the conformance classes. The conformance classes are essentially the building blocks. So I, I just bring up the bubbles that I had at the first slide to sort of show which building block uh, corresponds to which conformance class. Um, I'm not going to go into them in details because I'm going to be running out of time here. This is what a, a record looks like. It has two parts. It has uh, properties that are specific to the record for record management, things like the record ID and the record created and updated dates. And then it has a bunch of properties that are specific for describing the resource that you want to make discoverable. We expect and may encourage this list to be extended for specific use cases. I mean, this is just a core set. We absolutely expect that communities of interest will extend this list of properties in the record so that it describes their resource in the way that they want to make it discoverable. Uh, this is the properties. These are the properties of the collection building block. They're essentially the same as the properties of a record. So you're more or less using the record properties to describe the catalog or the collection. And so they, they look very similar. Uh, these are the access paths for the searchable catalog. It's exactly the same as they, they were for EDR as it was for OGC API features. I don't have to get into too much detail about that. And these are the query parameters that are part of the, the API building block for OGC API record. So we have B-Box, Date, Time, and Limit, which are inherited from features. Then we had we have Q, Type, External ID, Property equals Value, Sort by, and Filter, Filter Lang, and Filter CRS from CQL. Q is text searching. Type is searching by resource type. External ID is searching the catalog by external identifiers. Property equals Value is doing equality predicates on the uh, resource, uh, the record properties, uh, if you haven't implemented CQL, and then if you have implemented CQL, you can build more complicated query expressions. Uh, the specification is uh, being developed in GitHub. There's the link. I've also included the link within that link that takes you to the implementation page where you can get some live implementations. And I'm done. Uh, these are this is our Thank contact you. information, <laughs> and yeah, I'm I, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, marathon, uh, this express uh, presentation, Peter. And uh, there are a lot of uh, questions in the in the question tab. Uh, unfortunately, we we're not gonna have time. Maybe just uh, one question. Maybe you can pick just one question and and answer it, and then answer the rest in the. Um, in the chat window. Uh, okay, are you, are are you asking me to pick? 
<laughs> just pick one. Ask me one, and I'll. Okay, I, 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 I will pick myself. Okay, how OGC API records relates to spatial temporal asset catalog API? Yeah. Okay. So stack is. I mean, we're hoping that once we're done with the specification, stack will be considered a, a profile of OGC API records. In other words, OGC API records will define the the sort of core base functionality, like the record, and stack has the extensions uh, for that for Earth observation uh, imagery and and so yeah, it's basically we're 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 working towards making stack a profile of OGC API records. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. And so let's thank uh, the three speakers for this excellent uh, presentation. Uh, I hope you can uh, continue the discussion in the in the chat window. As I said, we need to move to the to the next presentation. And now we are going to talk about how QGIS and OGC APIs work together. Uh, and for this presentation, we will have uh, again uh, Tom Karolidis, so I, I will leave him on the on the stage. Uh, and I'm going to remove 